So I'm going to start out just um, quickly tell you a little bit about myself, really quickly how I got to this point. I got like a five minute PowerPoint, which are really slick examples um, of what I'm going to do, and I'll get right into the demonstration because I know that you guys do a hard stop at probably like an hour or something. So I do want to make sure I finish. Um, I've never had to do a piece in an hour before. It's just been lots of breaks because of my dogs. So, but I think because I chose a small piece to be okay. So I started wood turning about six years ago. After I had an um, unexpected early retirement, I thought I would get back into my crafts. And I'm actually a bottle lace maker. And I thought, I would love to make my own tools, little miniature spindles and all the different things that we use. And I thought, $400, I can buy a leaf. It was quite the vortex. So as soon as I did that, I took a pen class, made a few pens, learned of all the other things you can do. And within the first few months, I went to the Raleigh Symposium. So there I was so inspired and overwhelmed. And some of you told me I should go to the Aramont event, which I did. Um, and then we met such wonderful women in such talent that I was really just going home into wood turning. Um, I got a background as a maybe photographer. And I was also had a degree in computer science. So I think I have a good blend of artistic and logic and analysis and detail, especially from the fiber arts that I do. I even just bought a loom, so I'm actually taking more steps, but I can make moon tools, so I'm late. So anyway, um, I mean, at the Raleigh Symposium, and I went to Chattanooga, I saw so much art that I used to think, who would ever embellish a piece of wood? It's beautiful. Well, I was wrong because that's all I wanted to do now. And I don't even want anything but cherry and maple so that I have stock to work on. Um, but a couple of things that influenced me is a year ago, the Agar Studio took the class, and I used a lot of the tools. That got to be expensive because the first thing I did when I got home was bought an NSK and airbrush tools. So it was all his fault. Um, and then I just started seeing different styles and dry brushing. And I think the biggest thing that turned me into doing a better dry brush technique than I was doing in the past um, is I watched Jacques Gussery in France teaching a class, and I got to just kind of sit in it. And I would leave when people do the work, and I come back for the next portion of the demo, and I learned so much from him, and I really admired his work. Um, so that's where I really started trying it and using some of the things I learned from him. So I want to totally give credit to him for all the opportunities I had to watch him. So I put together a quick little slide presentation to show you some pieces that I think are really awesome and a few of mine. So I have examples. I did not know Dixie was going to be here, and I didn't even know that he was going to be here. I here, and that, and then a few of mine. I'm going to talk a little bit about the brushes and tools, and while I'm doing that, I'm going to start passing these brushes around. I'll talk more about them, but you can see them. Um, and then I'll do a demonstration and then take any questions. I know there's a lot of talent in this room, and people who know more about color and paint than I do. I'm more about the technique. I don't know everything about colors, but I do know my color wheel. So, Quickly looking at this, you see texture, you see light, you see water, you see color and depth. And this is just a composite of the next few pieces I'm going to show you. But when you look at that, it's just so bold, it's almost a piece of art on its own, I think. So, yeah, this is the piece I really, one of the pieces I really love. And as you can see, there's different tones of greens and golds and whites. And he probably says he puts 60 coats of paint at a minimum. And yet you don't see the puddles sort of fill out because it's done with such a slow process of dry brushing. He actually, in one of his videos, as I watch a lot of his YouTube, um, mentioned that he either sold or donated this piece and he wished he had it because it's like one of his favorites and he loves the photo where it's like hanging in the air. I feel like that got my piece from the symposium. It got sold the next morning. I still wasn't done with the love affair with it. But. <laughs> Another piece would be went with a different color group. Um, with the reds, the oranges, the golds. Another one, um, I know really that this pattern, I, it's a little bit of what I've done in a couple of my spheres. He puts a little magnet in the spheres and a magnet in the base so that it doesn't fall off. But I don't know if he hollowed it or he carved out a chip and put it in there. I'll find that out because I'd like to do that to my spheres. And then this was a piece I actually tried to emulate with his bark theory and how he carves and he uses a burner as a tool to carve and he carves it and paints it. And I tried to do this piece here and I got the browns and grays wrong so I decided it needed to be green. 
Which and it sat in the room for a while, and it just wasn't done, and I added yellow, and I said, now you're done. Mm -hmm. Pass that one around. Um, another person that I really admire their work, Dixie. Um, I love the things that she does, too. I think that in some ways it's similar to Jack with the colors, the greens and the blues. And another one of her pieces, I've yet to try leaves. <laughs> I'm happy. So after I got back from the gay and had my new NSK, I needed to do something with it. So I decided I would just turn something and make it into a cottage. And I was a mother was a collector of David Winter's cottages. It's a British thing, the little cottages and you know, pot carries and everything. So I got one out and I looked at it and I started sketching around and then I did that and I dry brushed it. And then I put them in stall, so I said I need a brighter one and added flowers. And they're supposed to be you can put a little candle under them, fake ones. As we turn, you know, you put a flame in a piece of wood. Um, and then the, the light comes out the windows. Now, this fear, when I first started turning, I said, I need to go have a private lesson somewhere with nobody else there because the, the weakest thing gets all the attention and I was going to be demanding. So I went to this three day course with Rudy, and one of the things we did was just a sphere. And this sphere had burnish marks and everything else on it. Um, and it sat for three or four years in my emergency bucket, just thinking someday I would go back and do something with it. But after I thought I wanted to start doing more embellishing and paint, I got it out, sanded it off, and I carved it up and used um, the uh, cup rows to make the little stars or holes, whatever you want to call it. And then um, dry brush painted it. So this is probably the first piece besides the two cottages that I dry brush painted. Then I like it so much I made another one in blue. I call it Starry Nights because it looks kind of like the Van Gogh Starry Nights thing. And then I made this plate. What I've done lately is I've been doing the entangle. And it's, um, some of you might not know what it is, but it's basically a very mindful process of doodling. And there are certain rules if you're in formal entangle. So this is more entangle inspired art, ZIA. And I just kept doing different patterns and trying different things to see how I could bring it into my art. And what I found out is that I had a bonus thing from it because my skills of tool control greatly improved after all of that drawing for two hours in the evening with a glass of wine. There was some benefits. <laughs> so I really, so this is actually a technical pattern called Huggins. And I went ahead and did it on this, this plate. And um, I didn't intend to do the bowl, but there were so many scratch marks from my cutting, I decided it needed more embellishing, so it was an opportunity. <laughs> and then this piece, this is the piece that was at the symposium that got pinchy, that was so excited. I was sitting right next to it, and I watched the back go back and forth, and I kept like, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> um, this was my first hollow form, I just bought a print box with visualizer. And because I kept doing all of this embellishing, I needed to do hollow form, so I had more of a surface to put my art on. Um, so this is only about seven inches tall. When I first did it, I did not do the um, top finial to it. And I just sat there and looked, I think there's just something not right. I said, I think it needs a finial. So I went out and made the finial. And while I was doing it, I would say, I never go with the plan I have. It always morphs into something else. I did the top. It's not like the top wouldn't like the bottom. So I did that. And when I got out of I said, I should have made the top of the top also be a hollow form and have another pop in it. So I need to do that on the next one just to get that small. That piece sold the next morning and I still miss it, but I need to let me take it home and take photos of it. And this is the piece I've already been turning around. It's supposed to be bark. And then this is a piece that I was trying to go for leather, and somebody thought I was doing fabric. So it's really a piece of fabric now. <laughs> but it was more about dry brushing again, and you can't tell by these colors. Um, but it's, I'll pass it around. It's actually much prettier. Maybe I'm going to switch. I'm going to pass around. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually working on a hollow form now that I'm doing that on it. I'm still doing the carving. Um, and I found some more things about what colors to use for leather. So that one's going to be in a piece soon. OK, so now I'm going to talk about the tools that I use. I'm passing around the brushes. I do need them back to start the demonstration. Oh, that was fast. 
Okay. So I use golden products. Um, one of the things I learned through Jacques, who I'll say his name a lot, is that golden tests their products. They're more less light sensitive, they hold up, um, and they do a good job. So I just decided I'm going to stick with golden. So anything I'm going to paint, I start out with black gesso. But I recently learned you can use India inks too, and they might be more fluid and may not take up some of your texture so much, so I'm going to change that. But what I do use is GAP 100, um, and I mix maybe a drop to a teaspoon of paint ratio, mix it in, and it's scary at first because it, you're adding white to a color and all of a sudden your black's turning gray, but if you keep mixing it goes back to black. But it makes it last longer. And when you dry brush paint, you use so little paint that it's drying up on your palette before you can use it. So adding the gap to it makes a big difference. It's called a primer and it's an extender, but to me, it makes my paint last longer and makes it a little bit thinner so that it will smooth on the edges if you need fine edges. Tracy? Yes? On this piece here, do you have a template or something to, to make that, or are you doing the whole thing freehand? I used a pencil and a ruler and made dots. And then I drew, used the NSK and put little dots with a hole scar. And then that's the Huggins pattern. And then I, I, I lightly penciled so I didn't screw up the, the lines which way the curves go. And then I use a burner, which my new micro skills are really good for the tangle, and just made all the cards. And then I go back in and add depth. So it's a, a process to get to the depth and texture. Thank you. So these are the paints that Golden has, and they have three kinds that I basically use or, or are familiar with in the so flat matte acrylics, which I really like the mattes, um, but there's sometimes where you want something a little shinier. Then they have the fluid, and then they have the high flow. The fluid have a whole lot more colors to choose from, with funky names that, like I said, I don't know color, but I just look at it and I like the color. And then the high flow will go on more like an ink. They, 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 they don't soak in like a dye, but they are very, very fluid. And um, all of them will say um, their light sensitivity and, and how transparent, like if it's a black square, it's opaque. If it's half black and half white, it's semi-opaque. And if it's a white square with a line through it, it's semi-transparent. So different colors would have different transparencies. And if you're layering your paint, it might be important to know. Me, it's just trial and error what works. For brushes and tools, um, I use, based on what Jacques had recommended, the deer foot brushes. They look like a horse's foot for a deer's foot, and they have an angle. I have actually been researching some other brushes. This guy named Artis Opus is a British guy, and he does models and figurines and little miniature things, and he uses it. And I want to try it because of the way the brush can go up and down and not catch on the edges where you get heavier paint. It's hard to explain, but I may be switching. Um, lipstick brushes, some of you may be familiar with lipstick brushes, but they're little foam pieces that are about three eighths of an inch long. And I use them so much and so many times where I don't want to use a regular brush. I can use them for just about anything, so I always have them on hand. And there's also these little micro brushes. You can get them in the hobby centers, and they come in different sizes of different millimeters. Um, they're really good for getting into the little spaces where you just want to touch, like the starry night sphere that's going around. To get that silver painted, I use the micro brushes. Um, I use um, tape for a lot of different things. The reason I put this one here is because it has its own case, and it keeps the dust off the edges. I don't know if it's better than any other painter's tape. But when it's in the shop or anywhere else, it's not getting dog fur or sawdust on the edges, so you have nice clean tape. So I just like the case. If I had other tape, I'd put it in the same case. And then palette paper. Um, that needs to be good because I could grab a picture of palette paper off the internet, but I'm not picky in what I use. Palette paper usually is more absorbent on one side and not on the other. So when I get ready in a minute here to demonstrate, I'll show you why I like having both sides available. And then, of course, it's good to know um, the color wheel because how many people in here know if you mix red and green paint, what color are you going to get? Brown. Brown. And if you mix blue and orange, you don't get a gator, you get brown. So um, <laughs> if you're trying to do something with green and red 
and overlay it, you're going to get brown. So you really, and I haven't had a lot of practice getting around the wheel. As you notice, I go with the greens or the blues. But you would have to work your way around the wheel and add your paint so that it didn't color it based on the combination of colors. And I'll show you that when I start doing um, the demonstration. So today, we're going to end up with a piece like this. And I'll pass it around. And we're starting out where I've already carved it, got everything, and painted the black gesso on it. So we're going to start adding the color. And the first five or ten coats I add, you're going to say, she's not doing anything, it's still black. And then all of a sudden, maybe the 11th or 12th, oh, I can see it. You have to go slow. If you can see it change, you're doing it too fast. So what I did is I took a piece of board by four paper, and I drew my lines. I carved it out. I added all of the dimples, and I painted it black. And this is this finished one, so it's a little different, because this is the one we're working on here. And we're going to get to this point. Any questions right now? Tracy, that was excellent. Oh, thank you. That was excellent. I hope I can to define this. <laughs> well, I hope I have some great art to show in there. I don't need that anymore. We don't need the power anymore. Tracy, if you try... <coughs> Excuse me. If you tried doing that basket weave pattern on a bowl yet? On the bottom of a bowl, a oh, little small plates I've done a basket weave pattern. I'm just wondering how much trouble you're going to have when it starts changing diameter. I use a, a what is it called, the um, index? A, a graph paper, polar graph paper, oh. and I do everything to come to convergence. So I may say at the outside I want some fit, even with that new plate that somebody's taking on with them. Um, I do have one and a half inch here, but I can't go straight half inch because you're going towards the center. So I would put it there on have I print out a polar graph with the exact size of those things I need, and I make my marks and I pencil it on and things converge. <laughs> Okay, so to get started, I have a piece of this house paper down, and the shiny side, since it doesn't absorb the paint, is where I lay the paint down. And then when I'm trying to get it off the brush, I use this side of it. So I just fold it over and keep a bigger section of it. You can see what I mean? A bigger section of it for messing with my paints. When John was doing it, he could use this little piece like this for this whole project. Me, I'm going to come over here and over here, brown paper towels. I just cannot make a nice towel like he does. He's even doing them with his pieces. Um, so I recommend keeping glass of water available. And because I'm here, I have three washes so I can get my brush through the waters and kind of clean them up. Um, one thing I didn't bring is a sponge. I learned from this one website that if you keep putting your brush on a little damp, very slightly damp sponge before you hit the paint, it keeps the brush from drying out. Because when you use such little bits of paint, it tends to dry quickly and get little sandy, gritty stuff on your brush. And then you get a paint and it's messing up your almost finished piece. So it's like, oh crap. So, um, anyway, so I'm going to just today just use a paper towel and see how that works. I tried it at home and it made a big difference in keeping it wet. So we're going to go with blues, greens, and yellows. I don't need the black and white. And I shook these up in this morning. And I just take a little bit out. That's quite more than enough. And I'm starting with cobalt blue, which I like it after it has a little white in it. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, on the pieces that are going around, even on like the weaves, there's texture to it. Is the texture applied by the paint? No, I do that by carve, burn, sanding. So the texture's on it before you start to Yes. Even the surface texture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this, I could pass this around in the beginning. This has um, just been, like I showed you in the slide, carve, burn, painted black. 
And when you paint black, you'd be surprised when you come back to it how many pieces in there you missed. And you have to fold up every single angle of the light. And then I sometimes take, I don't have one of the green ones, a toothpick or one of those little micro brushes and just go in there, or one of those three hair brushes and go in there. Because once you paint it, you're going to see those pieces of maple stick through. So you, really, you think you get them all, but you go back two or three times and another one shows up. And you're like, how did you get in there? I thought I checked you. So I use the Deerco brushes. I've been trying to why I don't have a favorite brand. I do know sometimes I'm doing so much that my brushes go inside, and then I have to set it aside and pull them back out later. Um, they come in different sizes, so if you have to reach a different area, you can. So I'm going to connect this system here. So if I need to wet my brush, and I'm going to pick, pick up just a little bit of that paint, and I'm going to now get all of it off of the brush. And if I can see the paint on my hand, I've got too much paint. So I'm going to keep wiping it off. So it's almost off, and I feel good about that. Now, because I have underneath, I don't want to come in the paint that way. I just want to come down this way. Do we have a good view from that camera? Yeah. And I'm just going to figure out where I'm going to start, and very lightly, just like this, I'm barely going to touch it. Think of you trying to take a flea off a baby. You know, you're not going to pinch him, you're not going to smack him well if he's crying, right? But you're just going to really carefully try to take it off. So I'm just going to barely touch the lid. I'm only going in a downstroke. And I'm going to pick up a little more paint. I usually have a rainbow one down. And I'm not seeing anything yet, which means I'm not doing it wrong. How are we doing on time? I got 30 minutes, right? Now I can see, you can't, I can see just a hint of blue. Do you always start with a background that's black? Yes, I do, because that gives you the depth. And all the black that's in the creases, I hope not to get any paint on, because I wanted to show that depth. Oh, yeah. Not that. That. Cause, yeah, because all we see is the back of her hand. I'll try to use my hands to move. It's like watching grass grow. <laughs> well, the nice I think about this technique, though, is as long as I don't blob the paint on, I'm going to be using other colors. You can fix your mistakes fairly easily. And sometimes I have to grab the paper towel and go, no! and get it off of there really fast because once you've got a puddle, you're screwed. Now, I'm seeing some tints of blue in there compared to the black. But you probably can't from the camera. Yeah. I'm gonna wet my brush a little on the towel. That pulls some of the paint that starts sucking up out. And at some point, when I feel like I see blue everywhere. I will either add a little white or I'll start switching to, to a different color. Um, if I want to get to green, adding green is going to get me to teal, so I'm going to have to add yellow. So you have to think about your color wheel. I thought Jason would be here to correct me on all my colors. <laughs> You're safe tonight. I was going to originally bring like three pieces to do, and I realized I could only do one. And it was so much less stress. I, I promise you that you soon think that doesn't look good at all with it up there? Does it look less black and more maybe? Probably not yet. Yeah. 
And so I'm, I have my special knot here. And what I also want to do when I have the right color, and I feel like I'm not being able to bring the color out anymore because it's against a black background, what I will do is add some white and then go over with the dark color again so it has a lighter background so that you can actually see the color. And I think it was Jason who once said, everything needs a little yellow. Did you call, did you hear him say that sometime? What was that, Jack, in the color class? A little yellow adds to most paint. I didn't hear you, I'm sorry. That when you're doing colorful things, sometimes just adding a little bit of yellow makes it pop. I thought it, it was you were Jason said it, that. It, it depends on what color you're dealing with. It worked well when I did this and that in yellow, so. Well, that's I'm green, so you had blue in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to see it blue now. We don't have time for me to pass it and get it back. You can see it. Can you? Yeah. yeah. So now, now you're going to see it move. The first five minutes, I know, makes you want to sleep or go get a beer. Not a bad idea. James works well with wine. Yes, red wine. <laughs> Inspiration. Do you listen to music while you do this? Yes, and I paint to the beat. I carve to the beat and burn to the beat. And sometimes, like, this is too fast to talk, I'm getting sloppy. I have to slow it down. I want to see kind of one of those runner's playlists where they get, you pick the beat and you get all the songs in the same beat. Right. I need a runner's playlist at my painting. <laughs> What's your preferred music? If I'm really concentrating something without vocals, so jazz or classical, um, if I really want to go fast, I, I like the Rolling Stones channel. So is this the what speed are you turning at question? Yeah. <laughs> is this the what speed are you turning at question? Yes, the same thing. What speed is my music set at? OK, so I'm really seeing the blue, and I think you guys can now, too. I'm going to one more round of blue, and I'm going to switch. You never really know when you're done. I think some of you, as, as creators and artists, know you know when it's done. You don't know how soon far you are away from being done, but all of a sudden, you're like, you're done. And I kind of get that. I never knew that could happen, but certain pieces, I was like, you're not done yet. Like adding the finial to the, the fission piece. I was like, now you're done. Okay, so I'm going to. Now, I've heard all these stories. I'm probably abusing my brushes. You shouldn't get the ferrules wet. You shouldn't soak them in water. And I don't buy any brush and worry too much about my brush because I don't go through them that fast. But what I'm going to hear tonight is kind of go through two steps here to make sure I get all the water out and get paint out of them. At home, I, I got a bathroom right next door and I just run into that sink. Okay, so now I'm going to pick up the yellow. I may go back over that with the green, but if I do the green now, we're going to get teal, or I'm not looking to get teal. And if any of you know color and have suggestions, I am open to it. I am not a color expert. I just have to get the paint on. So now we're going over to a cadmium primrose yellow. And this one is semi-okay, and I don't think I have anything that's not a level one on it. Light scale. And I'm going to keep this brush because it's a little damp and that'll help keep it from getting all the little crinkly things on it. So, these. Are those paints pretty pricey? Yeah, they run things little, what are they, one ounce jars or two ounce jars are like six to twelve dollars depending on the color. But I use so little, I can almost go in with somebody and spill them or something. I didn't even use all the paint I poured out before. Doing that does splatter, I found out the hard way. Okay, right, so now you're going to see the magic. It's got rainbow colors in there. So this is. I'm going to write on top of the blue here because I'll kind of see how it's going to blend in. Hand check blue. It makes too much. Yeah. All right, here we go. You won't see it for a few coats. I see it. I don't think you can. 
Sample is that silver around? Did I pass around the sample? I actually went back with some of the chrome craft silver, I think it was, and with a very tiny brush, went on the edges to make it look like the foam because it's supposed to look like the ocean. I brought some with me to try out if we get that far. But this is coming up nice with the green. So I'll get a little bit more here. And now, because it's still fairly dark, even though I can see the colors, I'm probably going to add some white to brighten it up. Again, I, I make it up as I go because I don't know enough to have a plan. And I just like what I like and change, change when I don't because it's all about fun. You were the spot. <laughs> Would you come fix it? <laughs> How many years did it take you to carve that? This piece? The carving I did one day, and I have people get in the way of my life sometimes. Carving about an hour, and then to do all those dimples, which is one at a time, it's probably another hour. And I can too, because I had to have a sample to bring. <laughs> and I actually started doing the, the, the leather pieces, but they weren't done. And then because I didn't pay attention, and the pencil marks I didn't go down the wrong way, so I got to carve my way out of that. Okay, so I'm going to enrich this and get the white out and lift up the color a little bit before I'm going back over. Any questions while I'm turning here? The directionality of your brush strokes. Is it, are you rotating them or are you all in the same direction? I'm going, I'm going to go a little on an angle, but I'm making sure I'm going down the hoof. I'm never coming up because paint tends to build up on the tip of the brush and I don't want to come up and make a big smear like a bagel. What about relative to the face of the piece? Are you going in the same direction or are you rotating the piece? Or depends on, it depends on the piece and the texture or what I'm trying to achieve. If I don't want to get, because this has undercuts, I definitely don't want to come up under. So I'm going down the slopes, ski slopes. Okay. And it's a very flicker type thing. I'm not going all the way down. I don't know if there's a better angle to see how I do it. I, a little bit of a there. Is that? No more questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my brush is still damp, which is good because the paint's not building up into the little problems that it gets. So we're going to go with the white. And I love these little popsicle sticks because they're just the right size. Tracy, might you purposefully go against the way that you are, you typically do it in order to get a, a particular kind of contrast or to put paint into those undersurfaces? Well, I want the black to stay underneath. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to get paint in there because it wouldn't show the depth in there and the contrast. Um, so I definitely look at how this piece is. And if it's undercut that way, I'm never going to paint that way. I'm going to paint this way. Unless very carefully with a small brush, I then try to hit the edges. And then I will come back like I do with the Chrome Craft. And that was why I used the lipstick brush, got the paint on, everything I can get off of it. And then just very carefully using, I usually wear these, I'm doing okay without them. 
on site. But I'm super there because it's amazing the difference when you use close up things. I couldn't believe the mistakes I was making until I started wearing them. Oh, I got the already. And because I'm going to the lighter, I'm going to switch to a different brush just because I want to make sure there's nothing in there. I'm going to get it damp for a minute and do that. And then pick up the slightest amount of white. And sometimes I might even pick up, after I do this, white and blue together to get a lighter shade to go on. This is always the, if you get too much on this step, you get a lot of fixing to do. I think you can see now that I've got more color on the top, the black lines in between. You can see the differentiation more. You know, my mother was a, a very, fairly uh, famous equine artist. She knew the anatomy of a horse, every dimension and proportion, and she could do a painting that looked like a portrait, a photograph of a horse. And we always used to say, Mom, you could make so much more money if you would just do this all the time. But she only wanted to um, do it when she felt like it. And I'm starting to understand that. And all my different crafts, some days I feel like leaving, some days I want to make lace, sometimes I want to turn, some days I want to carve, and you can't talk me into doing something different. So I'm finally understanding why she had me in the right mood to make certain things. I'm going a little heavier now with the white, because I'm going to go back over it. And when you go back over with the blue on the way, it just adds a whole other level. Sometimes you try to do it and go right to the pick top. Have you ever seen the exoskeleton of an insect at really high magnification? Have I seen something? The exoskeleton of an insect at really high magnification? No. It lo it lo some of it looks a lot like this. Yeah. Yeah, you know. Like diatomaceous earth. What do you say? There's a book on nature, and in it, this piece here. Um, was due on grass, well, magnified 10,000 times. And the whole book of nature of things magnified, and that's, I have to like the colors and the look, because that's what I was going after. Nobody would even know that if you didn't tell them that. Okay, so I'm going to, a little bit more white than blue. Okay. And I don't necessarily get everywhere. Because then you just got solid color. So I leave some like clouds of that color. So that you see, like you can probably see in the, the sphere, it's got dark green, light greens, yellows. I miss that. Back to the blue. Now, I didn't mix the gap with this paint here, but usually I would take a dot drop of the gap, and this paint wouldn't dry up on the palette so fast. Does the base coat of black fill in little scratches? I make sure it's totally coated. I'm actually going to try the India A because I think it will go on thinner. And when you don't have as much texture, you lose your texture as each paint layer paints. So I want to try the ink. Is that what you would say, Jess? In the ink? Yeah, well, actually, there's acrylic ink, and it's you know it's acrylic too, so it's all acrylic. Is it like the high flow one? That I no, no, it's like it's like pen acrylic drawing ink. It, it's like India ink, but it's just acrylic. So it's much thinner body. Okay, yeah, I want to go to something thinner because I don't have great depth in my texture yet. 
or certain things. All right, so we're going to go back with the blue. I'm not going over the whole thing, so I want to leave some bit lighter. And I think I'm also going to add some more yellow and get it to green up a bit. Sometimes just touching the damp sponge will really paint out of the brush. I'm going to try the yellow now. Do another brush just to be sure I don't get there. Sometimes you don't think there's much on there. If you don't do the hand test, so you're sorry. So you can see how my hand is getting. <laughs> Uh, yes, I like the yellow coming back in. Can you see how the color is changing? Get me some more yellow. Yeah, that's really kind of together now. I've taped these up and taped the backs for two reasons. One, so I keep it clean so I might want to use the other side. Or two, I already used the other side and it screwed up, so I just turned it over and retaped it. So who knows what's on the back side of these? <laughs> so those yellows and blues, it's still not bright enough. I'm trying to get it to look like this one. Of course, you can see that I've got the gold on it. It's got a shimmer to it. So I'm going to go a lot more yellow. It's hard to duplicate something when you do it just by trial. Everything's unique. The nice thing about dry brush, it doesn't make a big mess. I think I need more white. the yellow and not switching brushes, I'm really just getting a lighter shade of yellow and it's kind of popping more. And you really just, you have to play, you're not going to get it perfect right away, you have to play with it and see what's working, adding that yellow helps with a little white. But I still need to bring in some teal, so I think when I add some green, I'll get to that teal color in there. The Opus Artist, Artist Dash Opus is a British company. They have YouTube videos out there on how they do this dry brush technique doing models and terrain and spacecrafts and castle buildings and grays and silvers. It's just a wonderful job. And their brushes are tapered on all sizes so we can go up and down and get to the side. I'm not sure if I like that or not, but I like what he was doing, so I did buy a set. And he's the one that has a little like a glass jar with a little sponge in it, and you just put a drop of water and you use that to keep wetting the brush. 
and has some brush cleaners that they use. But I love watching the videos and how they layered the colors on. They didn't do it the Jack Vestry way of 50 coats, but they did do a lot of dry brushing and layering. Okay, so we've got some lot of green and yellow shown in there, so I'm going to try to add blue back in, and I think that's dried up, so let's add just a hair more here. One of the things when I did this plate in the blues is when I got all done, I took a very, very skinny brush with white and I just went down the middle of each one to kind of add a, a, a highlight at the top to give it more dimension. And just got all the way off and went in this direction. If it was this way or this way or this way and just added that in there and it really made a big difference. Okay, so we've got our yellows and greens now. Can you see that? And we're going to go back to blue. There is some yellow in this brush, but that's okay. I don't know how I can keep it in the normal area. I just need more practice. Okay, got the right direction. some more white which is turning gray because of mixed and brush, but that's okay. It's too much. And I think what will really make this one pop if I do go over it with a little bit of that color. It looks like the water is reflecting, the sun's reflecting off the water. Sometimes it's the beauty of music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the yellow is brightening it up a bit now. I don't know enough about color that I, I'm just playing and keep trying and trying different things. And when I like the result, I'm good with that. A little bit more bright. Actually, a lot more white, and then I'm going to try to uh, see that blue. Almost is a pretty little print, yeah. Abstract. Darker again. Too far off. Got a little bit more teal, teal in this one. So I'll add some more blue. And we're green shade now. This thing doing fairly close right now. This this one has the gold on it, so I'm going to switch to the gold. So I brought white and silver. Go with white and silver.
you got to really rub this in until it gets all the clumps out of it. And then what I'm going to try to do is just very carefully come up my sides just a bit. So you can barely tell what's going on. And when you get the whole thing done, it's more than you think. And I can always go back a second time. And if it's too much, you can quickly go in there and take some off. And a brush would go underneath those ridges on me, and I, I'm probably rushing here a bit, but. Just trying to add a little sparkle and highlight. And I'm probably not being as careful as I should be, and I'm getting a few glitches. But that's why I might go get a toothpick and pluck them out. It's different than the gold with the silver. When you get the effect you're after, do you put a top coat of any kind on it? I don't. No, I, I, I asked Jack that same question, and he said he does not put a finish on it unless it's something like jewelry that's going to be worn and get handled. If it's not going to be handled, then he doesn't put a coat of finish on it. But in a piece of jewelry that you can rub on your clothes or in your hand, you would want to put something on it. Almost the same, considering this one took two or three hours. It's the same, they're different. But yeah, they're different. Um, I'll pass it around. So you're always trying to preserve those shadow lines? That's why you're always brushing everything right. on the shadow lines? When I cut it, I'll come undercut it maybe a millimeter. You go for more, but sometimes all the sanding takes it away and you're redoing, but I try to leave under it. I never want to paint that. And sometimes it gets there, but that's why I always do my stroke, only going down and watching the direction of the pattern and which way it goes. Even when I did this piece here, you see the lines all go around this way. I was very careful to always brush that way until in the very end I went around with the yellow just to put a highlight on the ends. Another thing I did is this piece here. When this one, I was just wanted to see how it would work. I took a piece of board. I forget where it's from, and I did three sections of carving or, or burning. These were all burned, and then I just tried with greens and yellows to do this. It's, it's really helpful to do what I call storyboards or whatever, just little pieces that you can practice on it. So when I was doing this one, then that's when I did that candle. I said, oh, I like this. Let me put it on something. So I did it on the candle. <coughs> I, I didn't get that. What kind of color uh, do you use for the black? I use black. I don't know, is it gesso or gesso? Gesso. Gesso. I never get it wrong. I say produce and produce. I never know which is right anymore. Um, I use the black gesso. gesso. Mm -hmm. um, but as I was saying, I think I want to switch to the acrylic ink because it'll go on more fluid, less thickness to it, and it won't take away from any of the the sharpness of your carving. Thanks. Any questions? So what do you use for the carving part? Um, it depends on what I'm carving. I have a NSK, the pneumatic dental drill, that runs at like 350,000 RPM. And then I have the blue micro motor, it's probably 45,000 RPM. And then I have a, the was the red burner, the double burn master, I think it is, burn master carver. And I'm learning to use the, the burner as a carver as well. In fact, that's why I tried to see what Jack had done with his bark. I went in and, and I did a lot of carving and then got underneath with the burner. 
and I sharpen the blades, like the skew blade. I'll sit there with a honing card and get it really sharp, so I'm cutting the wood with the blade as well as burning it. And I'm going to go deeper than you think, because it's not always going to be that deep when you get done sanding and, and moving things around. Same with these spheres. This is actually following the lines of the grain that were in the sphere. And so I had to not only cut in, then I had to cut up under it and not sand it away. And one of the reasons I have all the dimples is to take away from all the marks I leave behind from all my carpet. <laughs> so but I think that's one of the reasons I can do a platter and not worry about this. If they've got sanding scratches in it, I'm going to carve over it. So it's just my way of cheating and get to a better finished product. What do you use for sanding? Was I saying again? What do you use for sanding? Everything and anything. I have some foam back sanding paper. I have some sanding sticks. I can cut a piece of up and do it. I tried using some of the sanding burrs or whatever things you can use, but to me they're too coarse and they don't give me the finish that I want. So I just try one thing. If it doesn't get in, I something else. So you're using sandpaper on the exterior at the end? Um, yes, in some places. Like on this, I might have taken a thin piece and just laid it in there underneath to get the underside. And we want to get rid of the fuzzies, which is my biggest problem these days, is getting rid of the fuzzies after a dough party without losing anything or reshaping it. Um, I found these slender sets of their colored things that have like a band of sandpaper, like a quarter inch wide, but it's in a band about this small. And one end is brown and the other end is pointy. And you can keep moving the band around the tool to get clean pieces of it. And in different color coded ones, you can have one for every grip. And depending on where you're trying to get in, those are very helpful. But if you have a lot of undulations or something, it's too long of a stick. It doesn't make the turns. And that's where I usually go more to a sandpaper. Um, and if I need to mold the sandpaper to get in, I like the foam back ones because I feel like I'm not then getting a grease line from the paper causing damage instead of fixing the wood. I sometimes do more harm than good when I try to make things better. You can use rippers, and tiny little rippers. It's like a metal sculpted file of sorts with different shapes. Yeah, when they said before. I'll have to look at them. Rizzler, R-I-S-L-E-R? R-I-S-L-E-R. Rizzler. Rizzler, F-F, okay. I'm bad here. say that in the beginning. Yeah, I needed to do something because I want to get more into some of the things I have in my mind. I'm like, all these ideas coming out of me, and I'm like, well, I have a tool to do that. So like, I need to do a set of tools, and I think I'm files and things like that are going to be helpful for what I want to do. Any other questions? Very good demo. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm doing great in Jacksonville in two weeks. <laughs> this demo again in Jacksonville. You were my practice club. The, you know, the 20 nice people that were supposed to be here. Yay! I don't know about, about y'all, but I was fairly impressed. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of information there. Hopefully, hopefully, we got a good recording. We'll get it up on our YouTube channel. And then, I'll be able to see it. I won't have to roll around the room. Uh, thank you, guests, for coming and joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.